Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our PMF Connect session. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm a head of product at the Product Management Festival. And uh, actually, this PMF Connect session is uh, not a new initiative. Uh, we've started it quite a while back because um, after our conferences, people wanted to stay in touch throughout the years. Um, then we've actually dedicated our time to finding more in-person um, meeting opportunities like our PMF nights or our uh, executive summits. Uh, but finally, uh, in this time where we're, uh, most of us are bound to stay at home, I think um, this is a great opportunity to resurrect them. Uh, and actually, uh, we've received quite a few uh, suggestions and proposals from people who want to join or want to share what's happening in their lives during these times. I think there are quite uh, some fortunate and unfortunate events uh, which um, are, are happening. Uh, today we have a quite uh, um, uh, interesting topic um, which uh, Colin is going to speak about. Um, there are people who, because of COVID, have lost their jobs. Um, Colin has a super uh, specific approach on this because he's a product leader, a very successful one since years. Uh, anyway, um, just on short on the admin stuff for today, um, Colin's going to share his experience, a few slides. And then if you have questions, please um, write them in the chat. Um, we're going to take them at the end. Um, if there's the opportunity, you, you're noticing that everybody's muted. If there's the opportunity, I can unmute you so you can um, interact with Colin uh, during that. Um, that being said, stay tuned for our next events. We have uh, a bunch of planned series of uh, PMF Connects in the following weeks. If you want to speak, if you want to hear of a certain topic, just write us on the chat, on the email. Uh, we're here to support. And uh, it's actually very um, enthusiastic for us as well to see some uh, familiar faces and chat with product uh, people. Colin is also one of our board members and he has um, been on the PMF stage in uh, Singapore two years in a row. Um, people love his presentations. And with that being said, I'm just gonna pass on to him. Colin. All right, thank you so much, Julia. So um, just before I start, I'm gonna try and share my screen. So let's hope this works. All right. All right. Are you guys seeing this? You there? You can see, right? Okay, fantastic. All right, so I'm going to first start by thanking Yulia and the PMF for this opportunity. Um, actually, this was something that came out of a um, unfortunate event, and it was something that um, after much thinking, I decided to do, and I will elaborate a little bit more about this um, in the slide later. So the format is going to be, I'm going to try and keep this to a 30 minute presentation and then the rest of the time allow for some Q&A. Um, if you have questions, we're going to attempt or rather Yulia will attempt to try and collate the, the questions in the chat. Or if we can, maybe we'll have um, voice questions at the end. Uh, we'll, we'll see how things go. I want to try to keep it as fluid as possible. So um, basically let, let Yulia handle all of that. Right. So before I start, um, for those who don't know, my name is Colin. Obviously, it's on the first slide. Um, and I want to just give a little bit of an introduction about, you know, how I present and things like that. So at least it sets the stage. So the first thing is that um, this is um, the way I like to present is to use um, themes in my decks. So if, especially in the Im imagery of it. So if you, for those of you who've seen me in PMF Singapore last year, I think you remember that the theme that I used there was actually Lego Man, right? So all the images were of Lego Man to sort of complement the, the, the topic. So this is, I'm gonna try and be a little bit more um, interactive. So if you can use the chat, right? So based on the cover picture, what do you think the theme of the imagery is gonna be for this talk? I'm just gonna give you guys like 30 seconds to, to actually, um, yeah, type it out. Oh. 
Okay, so one protection. person said protection, <laughs> coping. coping, looking ahead. Okay, you, all right. Um, so you guys are really taking this very seriously. Think a little bit more lighthearted, okay? So, um, or rather, think broader strokes, yes. Women? Oh, okay, that, that's very interesting. I don't think that looks, that's actually a guy, by the way. All right, now we'll, we'll wait for one or two more, one or two more in, um, chats to come in and then I'll continue, okay? So we've got protection, we've got coping, we've got looking ahead, we've got mental health, we've got women. Anybody else want to try? Packing cocaine. Andreas, you are a riot, my friend. Um, surgery. Okay, all right, um, let, let's, let's continue now. So actually, it's none of all those things, actually. So the theme imagery for today is actually going to be COVID-19. It's all going to revolve around COVID. So if you thought about it, um, if you didn't type it, but you were thinking about it, give yourself like 20 million points that are worth nothing. Um, it's just for fun. Okay, so that's the imagery that I'm going to have today. Um, it's also my first time doing a talk like this online. So bear with me if there are, you know, I have hiccups here and there. Um, but I have to tell you that right now, I know how all the talk show hosts feel, right? Um, if you guys watch like Trevor Noah and Steve, Steve Colbert, right? That the first time they did their talks online, it just sounded so weird because it's empty. Nobody's laughing, you know. And, and like for me, having been a speaker where you have a live audience, you usually feed off that energy. I, I feel nothing right now. So, um, yeah, so you know, I'll try my best to keep the energy levels high. And also, um, there is a specific purpose for this as well, because um, this is a heavy topic. And, and I actually talked about this as well in another event last Friday, and it just went really somber. So I'm going to try to keep the, the mood a little lighter. So at least it becomes a little easier to, to process. So last point, the cover image actually looks a little bit like out of a horror movie. Um, at least that's, that's to me. It looks a little, little bit like a horror movie aside from it showing a man in a mask. And there's a reason for this because this is the first horror picture you're going to see. The second horror picture is actually this. Oh, yeah. Can you see this? No, this is the real horror picture right here. This is, this is a terrible picture, right? This is a picture of me, if you didn't realize. So, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm actually a PMF board member, as uh, Yulia has mentioned. I have 10 years of experience in product management. Um, I'm based out of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. I've been doing it for 10 years. And when I started, many people, many companies didn't have that role. Um, and I've also put a little bit of a map there of all the, you know, tags that I feel are related to me. I'm also the co-founder of a uh, meetup group in Malaysia called PM Huddle. Oh, sorry. Yes, there we go. And uh, I'm also the organ organizing committee for Agile Malaysia. So that's a little bit about myself. I'll put in some fun trivia for you guys as well. I'm actually a computer science graduate uh, who hated programming. Um, and actually in another podcast, I actually mentioned this before my final year supervisor actually gave me an endorsement letter that talked about how I'm better at concepts. So I'm not sure whether that's, you know, a backhanded compliment or something, but yeah, that's, that's basically how I realized that, you know, I'm probably not a very good techie guy, but I'll probably cut it as a product person. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, let's not dwell there for too long, right? Now let's start with why I want to talk about this. I think firstly, this is something that's happening on a global scale. This is not, this is not like SARS. This is not like most of the, the pandemics or epidemics that we've had in recent memory. This is happening on a global scale. It is not happening in isolation. Um, and being given the opportunity to talk about this, I think really helps us to cope better. So it's not just about people who, are, who have lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. But it's also about people who are in that position who they're not sure about. I think some of the things that I will talk about may resonate with you. And I'm hoping that by talking about it rather than not talking about it, it's going to help some of us. The other thing is also I want to bring awareness a bit more about this when we're talking about job loss because not many people are talking about this. I'll give you uh, an example, right? I use LinkedIn a lot and I think a lot of you do. Um, as well. That's how we ended up with 60 people signing up for this, aside from the emails going out. But LinkedIn has 
a lot of posts about, um, you know, in COVID-19, we need to hustle, we need to not give up and, and things like that. But there's actually very little content about the mental health aspect or thing, uh, of things or actually uh, coping with loss at this time. And so, again, I think talking about it is going to be good. The next thing is, I actually think that things are going to get worse. We are at, this, this pandemic is something that we've not seen probably since the Spanish flu, um, I think, at least from my research, that, that's what it look like, looks like. And unfortunately, even when we start sort of going back to normal, you've heard everyone say, this is the new normal. This is not just any normal. We're not going to go back to suddenly having, you know, big events. We're not going to suddenly, you know, suddenly go back to doing the things the way they were. What that also means is that our businesses are going to function differently. So even though um, in, for countries that are currently in lockdown and offices are closed, it may open again. But does that mean that revenue is going to come back immediately? Highly likely not. The business models that used to work pre, uh, uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID, I think is going to change a lot. So in actual fact, things are going to get worse. And I think the, the earlier we deal with this, this uncertainty, this um, precariousness of our businesses and also our jobs, um, I think it prepares us better as well. Um, I, I was just talking to, to a friend of mine um, who, who's working in Amsterdam now, and even he said the exact same thing, you know, things are going to get worse. So it's not something that I, I believe is, you know, me coming out of just my own experience, but it's actually coming out of conversations that I'm having with other product leaders um, as well. And the thing is, from a product leader's perspective, some of us may be thinking that, you know, product roles are important, they're not affected. Um, and, you know, I'm a product leader, I'm probably safe. I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. And I'm qualified to talk about this because I actually lost my job earlier this month. Um, I was working with an early stage startup and um, I'll, I'll walk through a little bit of my thought process and things like that, but it is something that is real. Nobody is spared. Even if you're a product leader, you are at risk. So it, it really required me to, to think, as I was saying earlier, whether I, wa- I was going to you know, do things discreetly and, and try to find a new job, but I actually made the decision that you know, I think this global struggle that we're having would be a lot more valuable if I can share what I've learned um, to to some others. So that's why I'm here. So what happened, right? Um, As you look at that image there of a crime scene or rather, you know, of a murder scene of a bee. So I worked in a company, a startup that serviced two markets, Hong Kong and Singapore. And Hong Kong has not been performing well. It's not been our main revenue driver for a while. Um, last year itself, you know, Hong Kong was struggling with protests and then COVID right after, which meant that, you know, we were super reliant on Singapore. Um, and at, at that time, we felt that Singapore was doing well. Um, infections for COVID were low double digits, right? So we're talking about 20 a day and the government seemed to have a really good grasp on closing the borders, making sure there were no um, uh, so there were no like visitors, short-term visitors, only long-term pass holders and permanent residents coming in. Um, and we thought we were okay. And this was at the end of February. And we were actually redoing our, our quarterly roadmap to, to reevaluate what was important and what we would need to do. So we actually thought that, you know, in February, at the end of February, we were looking in a steady, uh, we were looking steady, even if it meant that 30% revenue was, uh, was going to drop. And so that was how we planned it. We made some decisions to reprioritize and do some new things. But I can tell you that within a space of four weeks, it changed so drastically from, you know, being in a position where we thought we would come out stronger, probably less profitable, but stronger to a point where, I had to be let go. So four weeks was a very fast time and we didn't even manage to, well, I didn't manage to see some of the things, the pivots that I put in place to actually see come to pass. We actually did three financial projections in that four weeks, just to give you guys an idea of, you know, how quickly things changed. 
And really the final nail in the coffin was when Singapore government announced that they were going to go into lockdown, which meant that, you know, it, our revenue was going to drop by 80, 90%. So that's very, very scary for any company. So let me go into the, the next slide here, right? The title says same, same, but different. Um, for those of you who are not based out of Asia, that line may not sound very familiar. Um, but it's actually something, it's from the Thai language. They usually say, say, they call it same, same, but different. It means that it's kind of like the same, but it's not. And that's what I want to talk about. Like what is different about the, the era of COVID that we're in versus all the other pandemics, all the other recessions that we're facing, right? I think the first one is it is unprecedented and I've already talked about it. It's on a global scale. Almost every major country is in some kind of lockdown or at the very least in some kind of social distancing mode. Um, in fact, one article I read said that, you know, the word unprecedented has been used in an unprecedented number of times since COVID began. So it just, just gives you a little feel of what, you know, how different things are, even though it looks like it's the same. So, what I wanted to, to approach with the word unprecedented here is to say that a lot of us in, on the business side, we, we wouldn't have predicted this. Like we would have predicted that there was some form of a pandemic coming, right? We knew that when the outbreak started in Wuhan at the end of December and it started getting worse in, in January. But many, many of us, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that, you know, I wasn't ready for how big that impact was going to be. It was unprecedented, literally, right? And the thing about this unprecedentedness is the fight against uncertainty. You see, the thing is, in, like, let's say we go into a normal recession. You know that this is typically going to last a few months, maybe a year, but things go back to normal. The thing about COVID in an era of COVID is that you don't know. So for example, when Singapore uh, went into lockdown, Malaysia had already been in lockdown, you know, countries, um, you know, countries like um, Spain and Italy were also in lockdown. Nobody knows or nobody knew how long this lockdown would last. In Malaysia, we're into our sixth week of lockdown. In Singapore, they've extended it by another month. So even if your business, you were ready to bite the bullet and say, we're going to rough it out until this is over and we can start recovering. The problem is you don't know when your recovery starts. And, and I said it um, earlier that when even when the lockdown gets removed and um, we loosen the, the restrictions a little bit, it doesn't mean that revenue automatically goes up again. So you're fighting against uncertainty and businesses fighting uncertainty is going to be tough. So for example, in my case, we were going to have to potentially run with 10% revenue and 100% operating costs. It was crazy and we didn't know how long this would last. So it meant that Companies in this case would need to take the worst case scenario, just like us. We took the third um, financial projection, which was the worst case scenario of only 10% and how long we would last with 100% operating cost and we wouldn't last very long. So we had to cut costs. And the thing is, maybe some of you are thinking that, hey, you know, you're an early stage startup, your runway is not that long. I can tell you that it is not just the early stage startups. Um, one of the biggest startups in Singapore just went into the papers a few days ago saying that they may potentially need to look at downsizing. Uh, one of the unicorns that came out of um, Indonesia, I think it's a unicorn, um, I could be wrong, but one of those companies has actually frozen hiring and some of the new hires were actually um, retrenched on the day that they joined. Um, in Australia, Qantas Digital had their entire digital arm dissolved. Um, Air Asia is talking about having to take a government loan in order to survive because, again, they don't know how long this will last, how much revenue will come back once you know, travel is allowed again. So the fight against uncertainty is real. Now, the next one is speed of change. We, you know, Pre-COVID, we always talked about speed of change in terms of how fast we go to market. Well, this speed of change as to how things dropped in terms of you know, things going south was so fast. Like I mentioned, right? three financial projections in four weeks. The first week, we were looking at consolidating our position. By the end of the second week, we were trying to pivot and trying to, to really make massive changes. By the end of the fourth week, I already lost my job. So the speed of change has gone so fast 
And that was part of the unprecedentedness of the whole issue because no one could have predicted that would have gone south this fast, right? And the last point is that it's changing societal behaviors and habits. Once we go back out of COVID, things are going to be different. It is most likely that international travel is not going to be allowed or it's going to be limited for a while. What does that mean for the travel industry? Um, what does it mean for the banking industry? Um, because the thing is, right now, people are taking lots of loans in order to survive. When we come out of COVID, can they repay their loans, right? Businesses taking loans as well. All the, all the plans that governments are putting in place, it's literally changing the world that we know. So it, as a product leader as well, in, it's not just about whether we lose our jobs, whether we lose our positions. It's also about how do we tackle then the world that is in front of us once we finish COVID. And so this brings me to my next point, right? Does it mean that product management, product leaders are sacrificial lambs? Because the thing is, the thing is, are we critical enough to the business to stay? I'm going to talk a little bit from my personal view and also what I think is the prevalent view in the industry. Unfortunately, I think if you are in a startup or in a company where you're the first product hire, it is likely that one of the founders or the CEO was holding that head of product position. So it is likely that in the event cost cutting needs to happen or they need to downsize, they can fall back to the previous person who was doing it like what happened to me. So in that sense, we're nice to have. The second point is product management, product leaders, especially now the roles of uh, you know, chief product officers, VPs of product. It is something that is really gaining traction and product leadership is now in high demand, which means that we also have the opportunity to to get really nice positions, uh, nice perks, nice salary. But that also means that we have the highest visibilities when it comes to cost cutting measures, especially when you combine that with the, the role before where it's a nice to have if there was somebody else who was making that position. The third one, not hardcore enough. Um, so hardcore here is a pun on, on, on how core the role or the division is to the company. So if you're in a big enterprise or you are in a company that spun up um, um, a, a startup within an enterprise, for example, how critical is that role? How critical is that division to the core business of the company? So if we go back to Qantas Digital, it got dissolved because Qantas core product was airlines and they needed to preserve that. And to do that, they were willing to actually dissolve the digital um, product. So, Colin, uh, can can I stop you for a second just because uh, your slides are frozen, which just don't froze, which is great. Oh, oh <laughs> so, sorry. Yeah, for the last three slides we haven't seen, so if you want to just go, yeah, same, okay. same, but different was the last one. So just okay, uh, fantastic. So thanks. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. This is yeah, like I said, this is the first time I'm doing this online. I'm actually trying to use a different way of uh, presenting. So obviously that didn't work. I'll take that to note. All right, so next one, um, where were we? We are on the nice to have, high demand, high maintenance. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not hardcore enough. So how core are we to the business, right? And the next one is NKOTB. So here's the second part of the interaction. Those of you who know what NKOTB is, please type it in the chat. I would like to know. How many of you know what NKOTB means? Fantastic. So, uh, the, you know, Eric, Hendro, and Aditya, you have literally just betrayed your age. Yes, exactly, Hendro. You have literally just betrayed your age, just like I did. <laughs> um, so, NKOTB was a pop boy band. I think they were like the first boy band, probably. Um, that means it stands for New Kids on the Block. And product management is a little bit like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Eric, there's... there's you, you, you win 50,000 points um, from me, which pretty much doesn't do anything. Yes, I know there's NSYNC as well, but okay, coming back to NKOTP, we're new kids on the block, which is a description of the role, right? Like I said, we're new to the table. And unfortunately, in a cutthroat industry, 
last in first out. So it means that, yes, we are potentially sacrificial lambs when it comes to, you know, whether we're risk averse or not, whether the business wants to keep us or not. So that's something I think we have to be prepared for. Um, and I say this with, with no malice. I really hope that, you know, everyone comes out of this keeping their jobs. Um, but I also don't want to, to sugarcoat it. And I think that there is that risk. So that brings me now to what can you do? Like if you're affected, you're on the brink, what do you do? So I'm going to tell, tell you guys a little story or a little bit of how I went through this, right? So we actually announced it at an all hands um, to, to, to say that there will be a group of people, a percentage of the company who would be let go. Now, given that I was in top management, I obviously knew about it different. Um, and I, tried as much as I could to prepare myself for it. But trust me, when the hammer falls, you're still never prepared for it, right? So I would say that those of, if you know friends or if you yourself are affected, I think one very critical thing to do is take time to grieve. Um, a lot of people I've seen on social media, where well, I don't really use Facebook actually, um, so I use more of Twitter um, and a lot of LinkedIn as well. People actually grieve about the death of a loved one. But it also applies to jobs. You know, I'm like, I loved my job. I really, I really loved the industry that I was in, the role that I was playing, um, you know, the stage of the company where it was. I loved everything about it and I still lost my job. And like I said, as much as I prepared for it, I was still not prepared when, you know, the final day came. Um, and so I took time to grieve, right? So I, um, that day I, I tried to, you know, I cleared off everything did all the handover documents, um, spoke to the founders, said my goodbyes. Um, but also during that night, I literally just took a break. You know, I couldn't break anywhere else because we're in lockdown. So I just took a break to the next room. So, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, just, I just played games. Literally, I, I just did mindless stuff that would allow me to not think about the present situation. And if you know the different stages of grief, I think we always start with um, denial. And, and I think that's why taking the time to grief is so important. And it really helped me as well to, to really cope with the situation. Secondly, I think it's very important to not just grieve because the, the danger of grieving without moving on is you fall into the trap of the danger of depression. So the next step is to find a support system. So I had my weekend of grief. And then after that, you know, um, e even through the weekend, um, I just, you know, sat down with my wife and just talked about, you know, the dreams that we had, you know, what we were going to do, how things were going to be so beautiful. And now it's not so beautiful. And then also some, some close friends who, who, who I could really, you know, pour my heart out to, uh, who are understanding enough to, to just listen. Because I think it, again, it's just that numbness that comes with just how raw everything is um, that, you know, the grieving and the support system, I think is very, very critical. But after that, after that, I think it's very, very important that we don't stay there, fix the mindset. So one of the very, for me, I think one of the critical crossroads that I was at was how was I going to deal with this? There were two choices, right? I could choose to, to mope about it and you know, blame everybody else and, 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 and all that, but I chose not to, right? Because like I showed in my slides, actually the slides that I showed before this is actually my thought process when I was going through it as well. Like I had to come to the realization that these, these are special times. These are extraordinarily weird times that we're living in, right? So I had to fix my mindset. I cannot blame other people and put yourself in the shoes of the business owners. Would you not have done the same thing? If there was a redundancy plan in place, somebody else could do that job and really cut off a, a major wage earner. Wouldn't you do that? I had to fix that mindset. And the other thing that was very critical was I took into account friends of mine who were doctors, friends of mine who were pharmacists, who were literally going every day to the hospital who some of, some of whom would not be able to see their kids, some of whom have had to deal with difficulties without a significant partner there because they're there serving the front lines. People who lost their loved ones to COVID, 
they have it a lot worse. They have a job, but they play with death every day. I don't, right? Um, one of the things that before I joined the, this startup, I, I realized that you joining an early stage startup would mean higher risk, right? Your runway is not so secure. Startups in general are more volatile unless you, know, you get lots and lots of funding. So before I, I joined, I made sure that we had set aside um, some rainy day savings. And I have that. So for me, I'm pretty much well equipped to deal with the situation at least for a few months, right? So I don't desperately have to beg, borrow or steal. Um, and that's something that I had to be very, very thankful for. I had a very supportive family. Um, you know, none of my, none of my families or my in-laws said, you know, oh, I told you not to join this startup. You know, I told you it's volatile. Go join a big company where you wouldn't get laid off and things like that. But so fix the mindset, you know, you grieve, you find a support system and then you fix the mindset and then you understand um, of, of a learning experience. We learn at every stage, you know, we always say we never stop learning until we die. And even in being laid off at this point in time, I've been learning a lot. I've been learning a lot about myself. I've been learning a lot about the people who've been supporting me, uh, you know, uh, emotionally, uh, people who've been in the background. I've learned a lot about businesses. I've been reading like crazy about how COVID is affecting businesses, how the new normal looks like. And I think we have to take it as a learning experience. And hopefully this prepares us for the future that lies ahead, the new normal as well. And I think the, the other thing about the mindset as well is to, to really look at the opportunity and adversity, right? So I said that, you know, our jobs in product management are potentially at risk. But you've also seen that companies with big war chests, you know, traditional behemoths in their industries, they're actually taking the opportunity to hire and hire big. So it means that there are opportunities. There might be less opportunities. Uh, there might be not the opportunities that you like. For example, I've always had a soft spot for, you know, small, medium product companies to smaller, smaller-ish ones my experience with enterprise has not been great. So I kind of, I've always pandered to, to that part of the, the, the spectrum. But right now for me, I have to realign my expectations. I have to reset my ambitions in that sense. What, what is my career going to look like when I get a new job? It may not be the same. It may not be what I want, but again, if I fix my mindset to say that, look, you know, this is not hundred percent what I want, but is it good? Can I learn? It's an opportunity in adversity, right? And again, I'm still better off than a lot of other people who, who are worse off with no savings, with no future, or you know, having to deal with the disease itself. So again, there's opportunities here that we should really um, embrace, even in through the darkest times. Um, I did another session talking about this, the same issue um, last Friday. And I still remember that one of the things that I ended with was to, to say that, you know, for those who are in this position or in an uncertain position, right, it, it feels like we're in this tunnel and it's a very long tunnel that is dark. But I can assure you that there's light at the end of the tunnel, even if you don't see it now. Just grasp the opportunities that are there. So now let's go to the next point, which is, what about those of us who either are not going through it or you know somebody else who's going through it, right? Um, it's very important here that even if you want to, you know, tell someone you need a hand, please don't touch, you know, observe social distancing where possible. Um, I wanted to say, you know, talk about the weather. Um, it's actually a, an internal joke that I had with my uni friends from, from a long time back. Uh, for those of you who know slang, Talk about the weather means, you know, just talk about nothing in, in particular. But in this particular case, we, we had just gone to university at that time. And uh, <laughs> this friend of ours was sort of making jokes about somebody else that was in the vicinity um, within earshot. And uh, suddenly realized that, you know, the person had heard in on that conversation and, and suddenly became, had this awkward silence. And he suddenly just broke out into, so how's the weather? And I think that applies here in, in the time of COVID. Sometimes there is this awkwardness about like, should I say something about it? Do I, do I, you know, do I call? Do I message? Do I email? What do I do? And if you're not sure, just talk about the weather. Like, and the reason for this is, I think 
um, try to be um, try to have regular check-ins with especially people that you know who are going through this uh, because like I said right having a support system is really important and some people don't have that um, and and they don't know how to reach out so if they don't know how to reach out perhaps it would be good if you can reach in instead of course unless someone tells you that I want to observe you know emotional distancing as well then of course we have to respect their their wishes but I think that's pretty important and I think just be there um, I, I have a friend who who told us this story about so he he was going through a very tough time so this is this story has nothing to do with COVID by the way this happened you know, quite a few years ago but I think the the understanding of just being there was very important he was going through a really really difficult time in his life um, and he didn't know how to reach out right and there was this one friend who, who would just call him every week and would literally talk about the weather. Just call up and ask him how he's doing. And that's all he would do. If, if, that, if the other person didn't want to talk, he would literally just hang there on the phone in silence for however long it took until the other person was ready to talk or say that, you know, today I'm, I'm not really ready to talk, you know, but thanks for calling. And the idea here is, showing support for another person i think is very very critical so don't forget that you know this this is about humans right and i think that's very critical we we spend so much of our lives in our careers in our professionals in our professions being professional and i think this is the one time you should not be professional and just be human i think that's very very critical so so if you know friends who are like that Especially, and, I, and again, you know, um, I hope nobody takes this personally. For those who tend to be quieter, they may be suffering in silence. So just take note of the people who are around you. And I wanted to end with this. This is actually a post um, I posted up in LinkedIn about a month ago. This was actually before I knew I was going to lose my job. But it was in those uncertain times which I was trying to fix my own mindset to really be thankful for what I had and to be thankful. And, and I think it's, it's worth reading out. You know, sometimes reading is, it sounds nicer than just, you know, reading it out and just, you know, reading it in your heart, right? It's like, it's hard to see the glass as half full when it seems like it's half empty. But if you're finding it hard to work from home, be thankful that you're able to work. If you're finding it hard to work with your family around, be thankful that you can be around them. If you're finding it hard because there have been cost-cutting measures, be thankful that you still have a job. If you're finding it hard that you don't have a job, be thankful that you still have your health. Spare a thought for those who are not as fortunate. These are unprecedented times, but let's stay positive and stay strong. And yes, I did use the word unprecedented. As you can see, it is unprecedented times. So, um, I think I would like to sort of end the, the presentation to say that, you know, we have a lot to be thankful for. The industry that we're in is cutting edge. It's, you know, it's interesting, it's new, it's sexy, it's a lot of opportunities, but it also has its risks. And let's not, you know, let's not mollycoddle, oh, sorry, let's not sugarcoat it. But at the same time, let's not fear the future. So I um, want to take some time to take questions, um, if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, Colin. That was very inspiring and emotional. And um, <laughs> I think everybody on the chat really appreciates you opening up about something which it's still hard to speak about. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that touched us all and uh, gloomy, but uh, with a glimpse of uh, hope uh, about the uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I'm gonna just um, go through a bit the chat. Um, there was one question, uh, question from Ritesh. Um, he asked when you were speaking about the, the, your preference towards uh, early startups, um, what was your intention when you joined this startup? So how come? Yeah, so what um, so all my previous leadership roles uh, before this had been to take over a team or take over a position. Um, and 
when this the 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 last opportunity that I had, um, why I wanted to join an early stage startup was because I wanted to start from have the opportunity to start from scratch. Like um, when I joined the, that company, um, it was actually I was the first product hire, um, um, taking over from the co-founder, uh, and you know, and I and I have to say I really enjoyed it. I, I set up the you know the process and you know started putting up the the confluence pages. You know what we believed in our principles, our playbook, how we worked, um, and and that's that's the thing that um, attracts me to to smaller companies. Um, the the speed of um, speed of changes and going to market they also tend to be a little bit faster